Man, I would never, I would never, I mean never consider myself a worship leader. Because first of all, I don't know music. Second of all, I don't know music. <laughs> and I don't have a good voice either. Yet, when I was standing here, I mean, remembering the work that Crystal does, I missed, I missed her big time. But then I was not trying to fill in those big shoes. I can't. By all means, I can't. Yet, I want to tell you something. I felt encouraged. I felt blessed. And this last song that we just sound together in preparation to hear God's word spoke to my heart more than every single song that I have, read, I have sang sitting in the congregation. It's not because all the preachers retire at the time of death and the worship leaders carry on to the next. You will be very busy. But it's because I think there is a power in leading the congregation into worship. Now I want to challenge you all. And also the people who are a part of this worship through Facebook or YouTube. I want to challenge you all. Step forward. If I dare doing that, you will do a great job. Much, much better the job than I did. And I, I did not plan, honestly, I did not plan doing this. But I, it was vibrant. The words became literally out, just standing out. And it was more meaningful. It's time for you to take the challenge. Talk to, Ke to, to, talk to Kevin and Phil afterwards. If they let me in, they definitely welcome you. We are in the middle of an expository sermon series on the Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And we went through all the way through the almost end of chapter 2. Then, then, then I decided to put a halt for two weeks. And there is a reason. Pentecost is upon us. I mean, this coming Sunday is the day of Pentecost. And we are going to celebrate the birthday of the church. The birth of the church. And, and how wonderful would that be to have a cake? Yeah. Well, not at the service. But then, right before that, it's, it's this past Thursday, the day of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ to heaven. This is an amazing, amazing 10 days window of time. And it's worth us to think and, and, and pray uh, ourselves. So right now, this Sunday is between the day of ascension and, and Pentecost. It's a part of this kind of patience. This is a time that Jesus said, hey, remain wherever you are at. Sit down. Don't go anywhere. Sit down until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Then go. That's the part. And this is, this is uh, one of the greatest mottos of any church to be a ch sending church, a church that is on the go. Any church that is a fro chosen, frozen, frozen, chosen, whatever it is, that sits down is good, but it's not great. God wants us to be a going church, a sending church. And that is why, I mean, whenever it's time for you, Linda and Tom, team, to, to move on, we will send you. We will pray for you, even though it's just around the corner. What is that, 300 miles? Just down the street. We will send you. We will pray for you and send you as, as uh, not just friends of the church. We will send you because we don't know where you're going. Who would be your neighbors? Who would be the people that you'll meet in the street? You will need to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus. And so do we, the rest of us. It doesn't matter if it's 300 miles, 200 miles, or 10 miles, or just a block from the church. And that is the, the, the window of preparation. Prepare yourself, but you cannot go. You cannot go unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a promise. That's, that's just a demand, the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why we are switching gears into the book of Acts today. And this coming Sunday. And this coming Sunday, in fact, by God's grace, we will have on Sunday, in Pentecost Sunday, we will have two sermons. So if you have ever missed a Sunday in the past 52 Sundays, that will reciprocate for that. But your Farsi must be good to hear the second sermon by, by next Sunday. We will have an English sermon and a Farsi sermon publicly from this, this, this pulpit. So just prepare yourself for two sermons or take a nap in between. Now, uh, next, next week, in addition, by the way, just in addition to our regular worship, we will have, uh, you have asked for it. Several of you have asked for it, and there you go. We will have two worship songs in Farsi. 
We will have two worship songs in Farsi. We'll have a portion of the service, the scripture reading. Uh, Datius has already started practicing the Farsi ones to, to read in Farsi. We will have a portion of the service in Farsi. We have invited a bunch of Iranians to come. And also, I hope, a lot of Americans will come because we will have a Pentecost picnic afterward. So to our friends who are a part of this congregation uh, locally uh, through Facebook or YouTube, please plan to be here on June the 9th around 10.30, let's say 10.25, when we will start the worship at 10.30, and then we will, uh, we will have a picnic right after the worship. Uh, a bunch of Iranian friends will do shish kebab and, and, and also bring some, some desserts uh, and join us. But beyond that, come to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive, to encounter the Holy Spirit in a fresh way and meaningful way. Dostan Aziz, Mahsan Aizani ke mogim Seattle va Seattle bozorg hastid, یک شنبه نه جون در کلیسای کراس رودز جلسه ویژه‌ای داریم برای به زبان فارسی و انگلیسی و دعوت دارید شما و عزیزانتون حتما بیایید هم دور هم خواهیم بود هم خدا رو پرستش خواهیم کرد و هم مشارکت و کباب بازی به امید میگم Now let us dig in into the, uh, the word of God The day of ascension is a great occasion to celebrate the amazing fact that the Lord is coming back it's not the departure. Listen carefully. The day of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ is a great cause to celebrate and recognize that the Lord Jesus is coming back. In the context of watching a movie that was recommended to my wife and I this past week by Bruno, we were soldiers. I started, as a foreigner, started grasping a more details about the sacrifice of 58,000 soldiers that made in Vietnam. 58,000. No small. It's, it's a huge sacrifice. And then, I've been in many memorial services in America. I have attended many memorial services in different cemeteries, different parts of the world, different parts of the U.S., from our national cemetery in, in Virginia and also different parts of national cemeteries around the U.S. But this time, I think, I think with, with a broken heart and at the same time, respect, I'm looking forward to the next Memorial Day, God willing, in 2020. It will be a different one for me. With that, and a lot of respect for the men and women who died for, for a greater cause, it is extremely important to look constructively at the sacrifice of these people who have made and also the people who have died ahead of us, who have gone to be with the Lord before you and I did. In the light of the day of ascension, and see what is that supposed to mean? One fact is very true that you all are dying, as do I. And this is, by the, by the way, even though for us Christians, believers in the Lord, it is, a, it is a, the best thing to be with the Lord, right? Amen to that. Yet it is difficult to face death. It's even for us Christians, it's, it's challenging. Why? Because life is precious. And God has given this life. This precious gift is a gift from God. And we love this. We honor God by living a full life as, as long as he allows us to live. Yet, there is that, that, just, that challenge. Now, with that introduction, so we're looking at the sacrifice of people who died for a greater cause, men and women in service. We look at our dying and the fragility of this life and the temporality of this life as we all are getting ready to take our last breath and say hello to the rest of the saints who have gone ahead of us waiting for the future people who will, who will join. And all these things, yet, there should be a constructive way to look at the fact, the reality of the day of ascension and learn something that would be uplifting, encouraging, and, and constructing for us today as we're waiting for the day of Pentecost. Brother Dathios John, would you please join us in the reading of, or help us, and lead us in the reading of God's holy word. Come on over. Please rise. 
guys for reading the word of God. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. And it begins with, So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood beside by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will not come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The grass withers, but the flower fades. And the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Please have a seat. Thank you, Brother Aziz. I'm so thankful for, uh, to God. Last week we missed you. I did the reading, and boy, you do a much better job than I do. Everyone here agrees, right? Thank you for your faithfulness. The book of Acts is the title of the book that was given to this particular book in the second century. And there has been that argument that whether or not if this is the true or good title, the Acts of Apostles, or it's actually the Acts of the Holy Spirit throughout. Both of those are correct. It is the second book of a two-volume book that Dr. Luke wrote. A real person, a real doctor, wrote these letters, the two of them, Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, to a real person, Theophilus, which his name, by the way, way, is a real person, a real man, yet has a great meaning. Theos Phileo, the friend of God, a godly friend of God, who is basically not only it's written to a particular and a real and a kind of real person, Nonetheless, it's also written to all friends of God. Every single person has to take these two books, who is a believer, as it is written to him or her. If you consider yourself a friend of God, being reconciled in Jesus Christ. And if not, this is an invitation. This letter could be yours. Repent, and this letter is yours. You will immediately become a Theophilus. His intention is clear from the first verses of this, the first volume. He wanted to write a historically accurate and orderly account, an accurate and orderly account of what has taken place around the life, the life and the ministry of Lord Jesus Christ, and also the formation and the growth of the Christian church, so that you may know, verse 4, chapter 1, so that you may know the truth concerning all things of which you have been informed. You know what you have been informed. In the passage that we just heard, there are a lot of facts. Each one of these facts could be a full sermon on its own. When does Jesus come back? That's a great, great sermon. Or, in whose authority... Who knows the time? Who can guesstimate the time? There are good sermons. How about the power of the Holy Spirit that you will be God's witnesses? But what I want to do this morning is not to go through all of those theologically complicated sermons, but I want to go back to the Bible, the simple proclamation and understanding and digging through these verses and see what does it have to do for us, the dying, physically dying people? What does it have to do with the great hope that we can look at the life of people who have gone ahead of us, either in service or somewhere else? How about our great parents, the great grandparents who have gone? How about that uncle or the neighbor 
or a friend or classmate that has gone ahead of us. The season of Easter, according to the calendar of the church, the church calendar ends this coming Sunday on the day of Pentecost. That's it. Yet, we are the people of Easter. We celebrate Easter literally every single time we get together. Either on Sunday here or another day of the week, somewhere else that people cannot get together for worship on Sundays, like in most Muslim nations. The day of the resurrection is, for most part of uh, for majority of Christians in the Middle East is on Friday. Because the, on Sundays, everybody works. The churches are closed. They cannot go to church. Or for some parts of the world, could be another day. Yet, that is important to remember that we are the Easter people. We are the people of the Easter. The Easter people celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. Anytime we get together, remembering that the temporality of this life has an ending to it. There is an end to it. This is a reality. This is fact. That if we don't believe that as a fact, well, let's talk. Let's read the Bible. That whether if Jesus has not bodily resurrected, the whole thing is a, is a, is a mistake. You're wasting your time, Paul says. Recently, I had a conversation with a, former, with a Muslim friend of mine. And, and, and I challenged him by asking him, just, so uh, what does this particular verse in the Bible mean? And he said, I don't know, that's a secret that Allah had probably with his prophet Muhammad or probably did not. Probably it's a secret of Allah himself. I said, okay, well, let's, just, let's go to this one. How about this one? He said, oh, the same thing. It's also a secret that God, Allah, their God, had either with himself or with his prophet Muhammad. <laughs> as, as you know, I mean, just sometimes uh, this is this my look look funny, I mean, but it, it was a part of my family when uh, uh, Rebecca was much, much younger. She was a little kiddo, and she said, Mom, let's have a secret. And then said, okay, what kind of secret? Oh, well, a family secret. Oh, that, that's a secret. That's a valid secret. I said, okay, how big of is the family? Well, you, Dad, Matthew, and Grandma, and Uncle, and Aunt, and a few others. I mean, that is not, that is not a secret. A secret is something that we intentionally, uh, for a good or a bad reason, hide it. I have some secrets, for example. And some of those secrets. And No, I'm not going to make confessions. <laughs> no, you got me wrong. Some of those secrets that I have have to do with my forgetfulness. I mean, like passwords. How many of you, don't answer that, that will embarrass you. How many of you truthfully and honestly remember all your password and all your usernames? I don't. Oh boy. I'm glad that I'm a part of this left and right thing. So I, I came up with a solution. I record those passwords. I have written them somewhere, secretive. If I tell you those secrets and pa uh, yeah, you, know, you won't be able to find that. If I tell you this piece of paper includes all my passwords, that's not secret anymore. It's not. I have kept it in a safe place, and in fact, in that safe place, I have coded those the way that even if you find it outside Nahid, exclude everyone here except Nahid, you will never, ever, ever realize what does that mean. It's all gibberish. Because I have a system of coding and confusing and mixing the two languages of English and Farsi and putting those together with a few characters that I feel comfortable sharing those Secrets with you, but you won't. I mean, there is no benefit. Oh, well, unless you're a good code breaker. What happens in this particular conversation that I had with my Muslim friend is that he is saying and insisting that Quran includes some secrets that Allah has revealed, yet he has not given any explanation. There is no meaning like Alif Lam Mim. And I said, what does that mean? I said, we don't know. Said anybody knows? No, that's a secret. If a secret is written, is no longer that is a secret. I mean, that can be anything but a secret. But my point to my friend was on this nonsense, gibberish stuff in Quran, is that you know what? The beauty of of Christianity is that the Lord Jesus Christ 
with everything in, re in the rejection of secret. In fact, what was kept hidden from the eyes and the brain and the understanding and the comprehension of human beings that nobody could fathom, God revealed in, he, in, in the entire meaning, in the fullness of the meaning of the word Emmanuel. That is the greatest thing that Moses begged. May I please see your face? And God says, oh no, you cannot. If you see my face, you'll die. But in the person of Jesus Christ, not only did Jesus Christ reveal that most and utmost secret and just a whole presence of God with us. He walked, he lived with us, but also he went further and he performed miracles. He broke bread. He spoke to people. He was the best storyteller in the world is to release those secrets, to tell us about the kingdom of God. Now, which one would you want to follow? In fact, I should ask many Muslim friends, which one do you want to follow? A gibberish word that nobody has the meaning and they're still wondering, scratching heads that why is that and what is that? Or the true and ultimate and absolute and all fairness God who has revealed himself in its entirety and I speak to us in simplicity of simple words that you and I can understand. Simple words like the words that we just read. I think you all know the answer, I hope. Jesus was walking and teaching in the Middle East, in the muddy alleys of the Middle East, in the midst of people and performing miracles that were easily understood by people, saying parables that would make people laugh. Oh, a camel going through the eye of a needle. You're kidding me. Or a, a sower of seeds, not knowing how to sow. You're kidding me. You're kidding me. Why he was throwing those seeds on the side of the road? And he was just challenging them. He just, hey, you know, that's, that's, the king, that's the picture of the kingdom of God. That's it. Got it? Yeah, oh, I got it. Jesus Christ, the Emmanuel, was born publicly, lived publicly, and served publicly. The same Jesus ate with people publicly. The same Jesus broke bread and gave cup to people publicly, to both his friends and his foes, at least in one occasion, Judas. The same Jesus appeared to many people following his resurrection publicly. The same Jesus after his resurrection came and again broke bread and emoas and ate fish with people on the side, on a shore lake, on a shoreline. The very same Jesus in front of people's eyes, the very same Jesus who lived, who was born and lived publicly in front of people and was in intimate relationship that people could touch his hands even after his resurrection. The very same Jesus stood in the middle of people like you and I, ordinary people, and ascended to heaven. This is amazing. This is real. This is not story. This is not saga. We're not talking about secrets that nobody would understand. It's just simple. That's simple. The beauty of the gospel is it in simplicity. Jesus Christ went up to it so that the Holy Spirit may come down dwelling in you and I. He went up so that the Holy Spirit can dwell in us. On the day of Pentecost, ordinary people like you and I were filled with the Holy Spirit and the amazing power of the Spirit to do the great work of the Lord, to be empowered, energized, to do God's work. Here's a big question. After receiving the Holy Spirit, where did the disciples perform what they were empowered to do? We know that they did the work, right? Jesus commanded these, these 10 days to stay in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere, right? That is clear. Jesus instructed them, stay in Jerusalem, stay where you are at, and being empowered. But then after that, they performed the work, right? Where did they do that? I mean, just was that in Jerusalem? 
or was it in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the, end of the ends of the earth? I think the latter is the, question, the answer, according to the Bible. Basically, they went out. Christ went to heaven so that his people may be empowered to go out. Jesus Christ ascended so that you and I will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out. There is an amazing power demonstrated in God's people when they are being sent out to go and being the muscles of God on earth, acting on God's behalf. One can see attributes such as selflessness or generosity, care, love, respect, joy in action when Christians go out. When Christians go out, people will see selflessness, generosity, care, love, respect. If the world out there does not see care in situations like what happened in Richmond Beach a couple of days ago, it's because there are not enough Christians out there. In the dry, spiritually dry land of Iran 200 years ago, when missionaries came, they started picking up rocks and started plowing the soil. They literally, I'm just talking not spiritually, literally, they changed the atmosphere, the temperature, the social temperature in Iran changed because there were a few of your great-grandparents and grand-uncles and aunts who, made the, who took the journey on the back of a ship for three months to make it to the Middle East. But that's not the end of it. You and I are called to do, in a world that is coming together now, we have Iranians, even in Lake Stevens, we have people from Egypt here. We were at a Euro store uh, with the Wilsons some month ago that the owners are from Lebanon. Now the world is coming here. It is our time to get on the back of our, our ship and drive, not for three months, maybe for three minutes, to share those attributes that God has given us. And I call those heavenly attributes. One can see that the Easter people sharing heavenly attributes that they have been blessed by as a result of patiently waiting for the Holy Spirit with the world and those becoming changing elements in a world that is so in need of Jesus Christ. This is the true miracle of Pentecost. All of a sudden, ordinary people like you and I are becoming one step closer to what God wants us to be. With one more Pentecost, we are not complete. We are, in, we are a work in progress. Now, last Sunday, we, we, we just meditated on the wrong, not theology. I call it ideology of the, uh, the becoming, God becoming. That is horrible. Yet there is that beautiful reality of what we call it sanctification, the, the understanding of us becoming slowly, but with one step at a time. So in this coming Pentecost, we're not Pentecostal, we're a Presbyterian church. In this coming Pentecost, there is something new for you and I to learn and to take that step, as so is, and so is today. In every time we read God's holy word and we preach it, there is a message for us. There is something for us to do if the, if the preacher is faithful to the calling. Now listen carefully. Because Christ ascended, the Holy Spirit descended so that people of God can be, can, you and I can present Jesus Christ. Following his resurrection, the Lord lived for 40 days among his disciples. 40 days until this day of ascendance. 40 days. Sometimes that 40 days is a long time, right? 40 days. Yet compared to three and a half years of ministry on earth, or compared to 33 years of his life on earth, that 40 days seems nothing, right? Yet these 40 days were significant days for you and I to learn, 
to the end of eternity. I mean, just to the end of the earth until the Lord comes. Number one, during this 40 days of living with glorified body, he showed us several things. Number one is that that is a promise being fulfilled that you and I will be resurrected in the Lord Jesus Christ with glorified bodies. I cannot wait for that body. I cannot wait for that body. It's not just for medical reasons that I have so many reasons to say I'm waiting for that, longing for that body. No, it's not just for medical. No! Because that body is super body. It's a body that is not limited to the physicality of this time. I can, you can walk through closed doors and go beyond closed windows and then say, peace be with you. Share shalom at that time. Singing shalom, shalom in heaven is something that I am longing for. I don't want to be limited. I want the glorified body, glorified body that is not in, in limited in pain and time and physicality and locations. I don't want to wait on this body that is so frail. At 40 days... Jesus did not do anything actually huge and, wow, significant. He did not turn five loaves and two fishes, feeding 5,000 men and their families. He did not. He did not do a three-chapter sermon on the mount during these 40, day, 40 days of his, his ascension. He didn't. He didn't raise anybody from the dead during these 40 days. He didn't turn. At least we don't re re read that record. In the Bible. And I believe if it had happened, at least Luke would have written that. It did not happen that Jesus is walking and then just saying, all right, come and follow me. He didn't even call people to come and follow him. He did, in fact, instead of, well, those are significant, those are important. But what he did is extremely important in our understanding and comprehension of the reality of being the people of the Easter. Are you the people of the Easter? That is what, is mean, what it means to be Easter people. That means that you, sir, you, ma'am, you are eternal. You have a promise, a confirmed promise that you will have a glorified body. You will have a glorified body. I will have a glorified body. Not because of who you are. No. It's because of what he has done. And he has given us the proof. The type of body that you will get is perfect. Not according to Hollywood definition. If we look carefully at the reality of Christ's resurrection, you and I will learn there's something huge. Friends, life after death is not just a proclamation or a promise anymore. It's a fact checked. In the person of Jesus Christ, life after death, glorified body is not like mine, but like Jesus, is now a proven reality that we are longing for. Next time that you may end up going to a cemetery, remembering a loved ones who have gone ahead of you, or a friend, or just, just visiting, giving a visitation to a cemetery, remember these words. The word of the truth, according to God's holy word. Remember to read Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Let me remember to take a peek at Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. After a study, a full long study of several months, how about reviewing that verse while walking down in, a, in an aisle in the cemetery, remembering Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. His ascension enabled the disciples to proclaim this message. Number one, that Jesus told his disciples, Jesus told his disciples he was about to enter his glory. And you can see that in Luke chapter 24. Number two, that he is now seated on the right hand of God Almighty. We've been, just two Sundays ago, we, we looked at the, one of the passages 
in, in Philippians that he's talking about the person who humbled himself and became in the shape of human beings, a servant, and not, not just, just not that low, but even lower than that. And he, he just lowered down himself to the point that he became seen and crucified. And God then exalted him. God exalted him into heavenly realms. In addition to Philippians, Mark chapter 16, verse 19. He has been exalted to be prince and savior, Acts chapter 2. He has been given a name above every name. Philippians chapter 2. He has obtained a more excellent name than the angels and anyone else, anything else. Hebrews chapter 1. Let me wrap up by these two conclusions. Number one, because Jesus Christ has ascended unto heaven because of the work that he has done, because he ascended to heaven. Thus, we have nothing to fear and everything to be hopeful for. Because of his ascendance to heaven, because the ascension of the Lord is a reality that took place in front of people's eyes. We have nothing to fear that we have everything to hope for. Listen to chapter 8 of the letter that Paul wrote to Romans. Romans 8, 31 through 38. Paul says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who, he who did not spare his own soul, but gave him up for, our, for us all. How will not he also be with, excuse me, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? That's the term. Who should bring, who, who dares to bring Accusations against, God, against God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that. Who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall, who shall separate us from God's love in Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things of present, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That is amazing. That's a great promise. That number one, because Christ has ascended into heaven, thus we have nothing to fear but everything to hope. Number two, because Christ Jesus has ascended into heaven, thus... We know that he will return one day. He victoriously will return one day as the king. 1 John chapter 7 verse 9. Excuse me, 1 John chapter 1 verses 7 and 9. The word of God. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ, His Son, cleanses us, cleanses us from all sins. If we say that we have no sin, we, we deceive ourselves, and truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. We, we are not going to have an altar call here. <laughs> but I'm going to do something else, much more effective than an altar call. An altar call sometimes is limited to the ability to walk forward. 
either emotionally, mentally, physically. An invitation to go to God's presence faithfully and honestly is something that we have done if we have believed, if we have given our heart to Christ. Yet it is not finished. There is that invitation. I don't know where you are at. Spiritually, where you are at, it's just, it's one of those secrets that probably is not written that could be decoded. It's a secret that probably just you and God is aware of that. That there is an invitation at publicly going to God's presence and bowing our heads and praying and recommitting ourselves, rededicating the rest of this short journey on earth to him. Would you please pray with me? God, in your mercy, forgive us of all our iniquities. Thank you that in the person of your son, Jesus Christ, you have given us the proof that resurrection from dead, the death, is not just a reality that you have performed in the person of Jesus Christ, but it's a promise that we have the affirmation, your seal, that will happen to all of us. Thank you that in the person of Jesus Christ, when we resurrect, we will have glorified bodies. We will be a part of your company, the company of Jesus. Help all of us. The power of the Holy Spirit. To faithfully and honestly and genuinely recommit and rededicate ourselves, every one of us, to you, repenting from all the shortcomings, the challenges, the doubts that have surrounded us, and asking your empowerment, not just to come us to us on the day of Pentecost, but to come us today, upon us, all over us, afresh. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.